You are a child of God, no longer slaves. Praise God. 
We'll give the, um, give the Lord a hand for the worship team and give the worship team a hand as well. Amen. Amen. That was awesome this morning. I told Pam, I said, you just kind of put the ball right on the tee. So, um, amen. Just, just a real presence of the Lord here and just so blessed to be here. And um, before, I, before I share, I did want to say that we do have some books in the back. I know many of you have our books um, or my books. Well, mine and Darla's. But anyway, um, but, but I've written three books over the last couple of years, and I actually have a fourth one that I'm working on now that should be out within the next probably six to eight weeks. But um, this one is called A World Without Absolutes, Discerning the Perils of Postmodern Thought. I actually spoke to about 300 leaders yesterday in Fairmont on the subject of cultural Marxism. A little different than what I'll do here this morning, but one of the hats I wear. But, um, but just really dealing with some of the stuff Pam was talking about, how that we're seeing an entire generation that has been told how to think and how to react and how to, to live their lives. And, and a lot of this really goes back to, of course, classical Marxism, which was really more economic than anything else. Well, Karl Marx, the German philosopher and economist that, um, that really espoused a way of living that would institute socialism. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but anyhow, Around 1931, there's a group of men from what they called the Frankfurt School, German philosophers that moved to Columbia University in Washington, D.C. And they began to look at a lot of Marxist philosophy and they realized that what Marx had espoused never took place. And really after World War I, there was a lot of depression, a lot of stuff that happened, especially in Europe because of what happened in the war. And so a lot of people that espoused Marxism walked away from it. And then we saw Lenin and Stalin, um, we saw um, Castro, of course, in Cuba, Che from Argentina, who led the Cuban Revolution. And we saw that really his Marxist ideas really led more to totalitarianism as well as killing millions of people. However, cultural Marxism came about because these men realized that if they could, through social engineering, um, come into a nation, into a region of the world and change the thinking patterns of people, then they could totally up in traditional Judeo-Christian thought patterns and traditions. And as a result, they've been very, very successful. And now we don't even know the difference in many places between a man or a woman. I mean, we, I could go on and on. I'm not going to do that. But anyway, this book deals with postmodernism, which is actually a, um, a child of Marxism, cultural Marxism. So that book is back there. Um, if you're under 25 and you don't have this book, just raise your hand. I'm going to throw it to you. I'm just kidding. But if you want this book, come and get it. I'll put it right here. Um, also, this is First Love Fire. I wrote this last year. It really deals with some of my personal testimony, but what it means to really sustain a life of intimacy with Jesus, even through the challenging or the hard times. And I wrote, this is my first book, Samuel's Arising, Waking Up to God's Prophetic Call. This is really about the role of the church, especially in an hour of cultural confusion and um, craziness that we're seeing, how we are to respond in this generation. So anyway, if you want that, you can come get them now or you can get them later. But anyway, those books are free, but you can have them all if you want them, brother. But they're in the back as well. So, you know, if you don't have them, if you don't have them, you can also, if we run out, we don't have a lot. I sold quite a few yesterday, but um, they're, they're available on Amazon. And, and honestly, these books are pretty much used to fund what we do overseas because we go to many third world and even fourth world areas that um, you know, we have to kind of take care of all the expenses, even paying, or paying for the food for the leaders that come into our conferences and stuff. But that's what that is used for. So praise God, thank you. Um, I usually don't do that, but since I had a table, I thought I would do that this morning. Well, listen, can I just pray once more this morning? I've, I've actually been really stirred in my heart the last really couple of weeks, especially as I am in the process of trying to complete the manuscript for this book that I'm writing. And I want to um, kind of share out of where I'm living this morning. And, and I believe the Lord's gonna speak to us here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, God, for showing up this morning in worship. We thank you, God, that, that there is nothing beyond your touch in this place today. And Lord, we ask that you would move by your spirit, God, that you would just awaken our hearts to truth today. Father, set your people free, Lord God, in, in, in this place and throughout the nation, God, throughout the world. God, we pray that the church would not assimilate to the culture of present social understanding, but Lord, that we would 
bring the culture with us, Lord, that we would realize that we are a kingdom people, that we do not bow down to the tenants or to the, the dictates of this world, but, Lord, we only bow our knee to Jesus. And, Lord, I pray today, awaken warriors in this room, God, prayer warriors, men and women that will fight against the, the thralls of sin that are trying to destroy our young people. Lord, those of us that will refuse to recant and to back up even though the battle is ferocious. Lord, that we would realize that with you, we are the majority this morning. And Father, I, I pray that these truths would become solidified in our hearts. And even as our brother prayed before service started, Lord, that, that this would not just be another service, but Lord, we would receive marching orders today to go forth and do what you've called us to do as your people. And the Lord, anoint your word, make us recipients of your word today, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am deep into um, the middle of a manuscript trying to, to complete a book, and, and I just, I, you know, when you're doing that, you kind of live in that world, especially those months or several weeks where you're researching and writing. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time teaching and talking about what it means to have an eternal mindset. And some of you have probably heard me share this story. I was, I was in Leonard Ravenhill's library several years ago now. Um, the late Leonard Ravenhill, he went to be with the Lord many years ago in the late 80s. But, but anyhow, I was visiting his son, David Ravenhill, when he and his wife still lived in Lindell, Texas. And um, I was in his dad's library one day and just kind of by myself. I just wanted to go in there, not because I was idolizing Ravenhill, but just to kind of see where he was at. I know he prayed, and I have a dear friend that worked with me at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry that was Ravenhill's prayer partner for many years and actually would drive Leonard Ravenhill to his meetings in his, last, in his latter years of preaching. But, um, but when I got into Ravenhill's office and I sat in his little wooden chair, that kind of creaked, and I sat back, and across from where I was sitting, Leonard Ravenhill had a plaque on the wall that he looked at every day, and it just simply said, keep me eternity conscious. Keep me eternity conscious. And it just kind of struck my heart, and I kind of knew back then that, that one day that I would probably write something or maybe publish something really dealing with what that really means. And, and to be honest with you, it, um, it impacted me so much that if you come into my office today in my home in, in Charlotte, you'll see right above my desk a plaque about this long that simply says, keep me eternity conscious. I had a, a brother make me this plaque so that every day when I'm in there praying, um, spending time with the Lord, spending time in the Word, that I am always arrested by that reality that we are to be a people with an eternal paradigm or an eternal mindset. And th this morning, um, I want to share with what I'm simply going to call, and I, this is actually the title of my book, so if you steal it, I know where you got it from. And um, I'll, my publisher's lawyer will send you a letter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, the, the name of my message this morning is something I simply want to call Tethered to Eternity. Tethered to Eternity. Now, what I've done is... I've, you know, for years I have loved reading and studying and even teaching about the great heroes of the faith, the Billy Grahams, the, the, the D.L. Moody's, um, the Charles Finney's, the Amy Carmichael's. I mean, all these, these great men and women of God that have had such a dramatic impact on culture and even on nations. And, and we love those people, and they're, they're powerful, and God used them. And, and I look at somebody like Billy Graham, who was born in Charlotte, on a dairy farm, and when you look at his life, one thing you know that only God could raise him up to do what he did around the world. It's not something that he woke up one day and he said, my goal is to become the largest evangelist or the biggest evangelist on the face of the earth. But, but God saw this humble man that as far as we know, by the grace of God, stayed holy, stayed faithful to his family and his wife, stayed faithful to the gospel, and, and God used his life in a very powerful way. So we, we know those names, and I love those names, and I've, I've written about them. I, I do a, a whole curriculum on giants of the faith where I teach 16 weeks about different individuals and go into their lives and their prayer lives and all this stuff. But the Lord really began to stir my heart recently as I began to write this book that my, my research was not to be the Billy Grahams and the D.L. Moody's and, and the Finney's, even though, of course, these are great men and women of God, but that I was to research 
the prayer warriors and the intercessors that prayed for these types of individuals. That, and, 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 and I'll tell you, it, it's a lot easier to find information on Billy Graham than it is the people that prayed for Billy Graham. It's a lot easier to find information on Charles Finney. But when I began to dig, and I'd heard of some of these names throughout, you know, throughout my um, time living for the Lord, especially as I've studied, but, but I began to discover different names, people like Abel Clary and people like Father Nash or a man, a Presbyterian preacher named Daniel Nash, who was a primary prayer warrior for Charles Finney. And, and I, I, I met a lady named Suzette Hattin and a lady by the, some of you met Margaret Viss, a lady from South Africa. And I, I began to study their lives and, and I, I saw patterns that, that I believe have to be restored in the generation that we live in right now. And these individuals were tethered to eternity. They, um, they, they lived in such a way that was very, um, it was a life of death to self, but it was a life that really brought eternal results and eternal joy, and many souls were birthed into the kingdom because of the price that they paid in intercession and in prayer. Like in the life of Abel Clary and Daniel Nash, these were two individuals that were great prayer warriors, and literally they would oftentimes be under wooden platforms, literally under on the ground laying down, praying while Charles Finney was preaching and begging people or calling people through the gospel to come to Jesus Christ and to repentance. When I look at the life of Margaret Viss and Suzette Hattin, they were with Reinhard Bonnke when Bonnke was only preaching to 20 and 30 people in Africa. But they would go to places in Africa, whether it be Nigeria or Kenya, wherever, um, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Cameroon, the, the nations of Africa that Bonke would go into. And these individuals would go oftentimes six to eight weeks ahead of Bonke and the evangelism team showing up. And they would spend as much as 12 to 15, sometimes 16 hours a day praying in the spirit for God to move when the evangelistic team would get there. And when we look at the fruit of like Reinhard Bonnke's ministry, we thank God for Bonnke, all the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. But, but I believe the real hero of the faith is not so much Bonnke, even though, of course, you could call him that. But the real heroes of the faith were the individuals that shouldered the eternal purposes of God for that generation, for that time period, and for that season. And I am, I am hungry in my own life to be that individual. I am desperate in my own life to see God awaken another generation that is really tethered to eternity. And I want to I read some scripture to you this morning. Um, the book of Acts, chapter 20, and we'll start in verse 17. I want to read in three different places the book of Acts, the 20th chapter and verse 17 this morning. This is familiar to, to, to many of you, I'm sure, but listen to this description of Paul with the elders of Ephesus. It said, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, speaking of the apostle Paul, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. When they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. One translation says tribulations await me. But listen to what Paul says. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. One translation, he says, these things do not move me. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now, 
the part that's, that really stands out to me in this entire narrative here, not the fact that, that Paul has set his face towards Jerusalem, not the fact that he tells these, these elders from the church of Ephesus that they will never see him again. Not even the fact that, that he says that, listen, I've been faithful to declare the entire counsel of God. I have preached the word of God without compromise. I have been faithful to the call of God. But the part where he says that, listen, I don't account my life as anything in the face of imprisonment, in the face of persecution, in the face of revealed tribulation that the Holy Spirit showed him as he's going towards Jerusalem. Again, one translation says, Paul said, these things do not move me. They do not affect me. In other words, he was going anyway. Now, I wonder this morning, I'm asking Keith Collins too, if the Lord said, Keith, I want you to go to, let's say, Yemen, where the Houthi rebels have really been demonstrative in recent weeks since the October 7 attack by Hamas in, in Israel. But if the Lord said, I want you to go to Yemen and I want you to go and preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit doesn't have to tell me, I know that if I go into that place, chances are, unless the Lord divinely protects me, that I'm going to be killed or martyred for preaching the gospel. But how many of us, if the Lord would say, if the Holy Spirit would lead us into a place like that, we would be able to say these things just don't even move me. It's, um, it's a paradigm that, to be honest with you, is foreign to many. It doesn't mean we don't love the Lord. It doesn't mean we're not saved. I'm not saying that. But, but I'm, I'm telling you, there, there's something that, that, that Paul was tethered to. And I believe eternity was more real to this man of God than the things of this present earth. The, the things of heaven were more precious and they were more valued to him than his comfort, than his, his, um, um, his health, than anything else. The thing that mattered to Paul was pleasing Jesus and he lived for things of eternal value. Now let's, let's go on and hear some of the words of Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 this morning. Paul says, so we do not lose heart though our outer self is wasting away. How many of you know that, friend, and I understand faith and, and we believe for healing, I understand that, but how many of you also understand and know that um, at almost 56 now, um, I don't have a 20-year-old body, right? I mean, you might think I do, but, but I really don't. <laughs> Just kidding. I had a lot more body this time last year. I've lost about 40 pounds of it, but, but, but my point is this. Um, of course, we believe in divine healing and, and health and all that kind of stuff. But Paul's very clear that our outer body is, is wasting. I mean, medically, scientifically, it's very easy to see that, that as we age, things begin to change in our bodies. There are some people that have this amazing longevity. And I believe a lot of that is maybe based on genetics. A lot of it's probably based on our diets and exercise or lack thereof and so forth and so on. But the bottom line is, Paul says, listen, our outer self is wasting away. And our inner self, however, is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, or they're temporal. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, what is Paul's definition of light, um, momentary affliction. Well, he was beat by the Jews five times with 39 lashes. He was beat to death and left outside a city to die. He knew what it was to be under house arrest. He knew what it was to be imprisoned in dungeons. He knew what it was to be cold and hungry and naked. He, he knew what it was to be shipwrecked. I mean, th this man had light, momentary afflictions. Now, modern afflictions are were canceled on Facebook or maybe somebody doesn't like a post that we put up that we thought was so great. And we feel like, or, or, or what, and in other words, a lot of the things that, that we consider challenges in light of eternity, they're nothing. Paul said, even the suffering that I have incurred in my own body is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that the Lord has prepared for me. He lived for things beyond this present world. He was not tethered to temporal things. He was tethered to eternity, friend. 
His, his life was, was made up of this radical love affair that he had with Jesus. And there was nothing that he was not willing to do to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus and to win as many people to Jesus as he could win. That was his passion. That was his heartbeat. When we look at the lives of these, these great missionaries throughout history, when I look at Hudson Taylor, Hudson Taylor's an amazing man. He's the one that started the Inland China Mission, I mean, many, many years ago. When Hudson Taylor went to China, he knew that, he understood what the Bible says when it says, you become all things to all men. He knew that he had to pretty much become a Chinaman. And he didn't embrace Buddhism or anything like that, but he dressed like a Chinaman. He learned the language. He learned the customs, and he brought the truth of the gospel. And as a result, some of the great leaders of the China church, men like Watchman Nee and David Youngie Cho in Korea was affected by Taylor's ministry. Some of the great leaders that we know throughout history are there as a result of this man giving his life for the Chinese people so that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be preached. It wasn't comfortable, it wasn't easy, but in eternity, friend, it was worth it, and it would still be worth it today. You see, these great men and women that have, have, have left the creature comforts of America and England and Canada, and there was great missionary movements out of all three of those regions of the world. I mean, they, they went with an eternal paradigm, and they knew that what they had experienced had to be shared with people who did not know the gospel. Friend, that's an eternal paradigm. Listen to one more scripture here, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Paul, again, writing here. He said, if then you have been raised or risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I, I, am, I am very much aware that a lot of the modern gospel that we hear, a lot of the modern teaching that we hear in churches about how that we can be good in this present world, are blessed, how that you can have a better life. And listen, there's truth to that. Don't misunderstand me. I, I believe the Lord likes to bless his people. I'm not against being blessed. But can I tell you something? Even God gives us the ability, the Bible says, even to create wealth. Some people have that gift in their lives. But it's not so you can drive a Jag or a Porsche. I mean, if that's what you drive, I'm not judging you. Um, but... It's not so that you can just have a bigger house or a bigger car. It's so that you can advance the kingdom of God in the hour that you live in. That's what true wealth is for, friend. Listen, those, listen, I, I know wealthy people and I know rich people. Rich people want you to know that they're rich and they flaunt it. Wealthy people usually wear the same clothes all the time and drive the same car and the same house they've lived in for years. But God uses them, and I have a couple of friends that are wealthy. I mean, they're, they're wealthy. God uses their life to advance the gospel in the nations of the earth. Why? Because he's entrusted them with wealth, because their affection are on things above. You see, I've said this here before. Many people in the church want Jesus to be a genie in a bottle or a Santa Claus. As long as we are blessed in this temporal world, then we serve him and we love him. But as soon as we go through a trial or a battle, we, we back away from our commitment to him and we wonder what's going on and why is God allowing this to help me? Listen, friend, God will meet you even in the darkest hour and he will provide himself. But when your affections are set on things above, it's not what you accumulate in this transient temporal world. It's what you set up as treasures in heaven. You see, the greatest heroes of the faith, I don't believe, stood on platforms and had their names on mar in marquee lights. I believe the greatest heroes of the faith are those that paid the price in the secret place and they gave their lives to reach souls. And to make disciples, they, they, they fathered and mothered the next generation effectively. And they imputed into them what it meant to have an eternal heartbeat, an eternal mindset. It is, listen, I understand it is very easy to be consumed with the pressures of life. It could be medical challenges, it could be your children, your grandchildren, it could be challenges in your marriage. Maybe it's what's today, the 2nd or 3rd of March, 3rd, is it 3rd? 
Anybody know what day it is? Third. <laughs> there you go. Third. I didn't know. <laughs> and, you know, maybe your, your, your mortgage payment's three days late or your rent payment's three days late. I, I, I've been there more than once. Maybe you need a new car. Listen, those are very real, real things. And I, I'm not telling you that God's not concerned with that part of your life. Of course he is. He loves you. And sometimes, you know, maybe it's a season you're going through. Sometimes maybe we have to reevaluate our responsibilities and see if we're not budgeting effectively or see if we're living above our means and adjust accordingly. You know, I mean, there, there, there's multiple things that bring people into those situations. And I'm not trying to be judgmental or anything like that. But, but, but listen to me. What really matters is not how good your car runs this morning. You know, we need good running cars. What matters is as our hearts really set on things that never rust or corrode or fade. You see, people that live for eternity refuse to be sucked in to the vacuum of temporal thinking. They refuse to be driven by fear and gossip and, and, and all these type of jealousy, envy, all the things that, that control so many people in churches who live for temporal gain and temporal accomplishments. People that live for eternity have a different set of priorities. They have a different way of praying. Forgiveness is not something they have to work up. It's something they live in. They understand when Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for they don't even know what they're doing. They understand that the Bible says that we forgive others. How? Just as the Lord has forgiven us. How do we do that, friend? Some things sound illogical. When I read Paul, some of his stuff in light of human um, understanding is illogical. How could a man, knowing that he was probably going to his death, simply say, these things do not move me? He was owned by something much greater, friend. He was owned by something that allowed him, as he wrote in, in Ephesians, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. You see, the reality is that we are the already, I mean, eschatologically, we are the already but not yet people. In other words, we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We are the fulfillment of the, the, the Jewish Old Testament prophets. We are the, the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are those that have been born again by the Spirit of God. We were sealed on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended on 120. I mean, friend, we are the people of God. However... There is still a future consummation when the Lord returns. And friend, this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of our lives. There are those that have gone on before us that are still part of the body of Christ. They cheer us on this, this morning. It's, it's a real thing. And when we live with that reality in view, a lot of the things that disturb us so much in this transient world begin to fall off. And we're able to see and process with the heart of the Lord. And we realize that our life is not our own. Paul said, I've been bought with a price. What's the print? The price is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus that prophesies into this room this morning that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That you do not have to live with stinking thinking. But friend, you can rise above that with an eternal paradigm. And you can literally be seated with Christ, as Paul said, in heavenly places this morning. This is not pie in the sky. This is not me trying to hoop you up and whoop. No, friend. No, friend. This is who we are called to be as the people of God. You see, a primary distinctive and characteristic of the early church, and, and really, especially the original apostles and even saints throughout the ages, was that they were fully apprehended by things of eternal value. As the apostles of Jesus went into their death, and all were martyred except for John, and they tried to martyr him, they boiled him in oil, church history says, but he survived that and was exiled about 60 miles off the coast of Ephesus on the island of Patmos where he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. But all of these men, these original apostles, suffered martyrdom. But there's no historical record, there's no biblical record 
where they came to the end of their lives and they regretted living for Jesus? In other words, they, they never came to a place that said, man, I wasted so much time. I could have made so much more money. They, they never came to a place where they said, I could have been much more fulfilled in myself if I would have quit following this young, passionate Jewish man named Jesus. No, friend, they were so tethered to the heartbeat of the eternal Son of God that the only thing that mattered to them was Jesus Christ and Him crucified, resurrected, ascended to the Father and coming back for His church. They were owned by eternity. That was their native air. That's the place that they lived in. They, um, they disturbed the atmospheres where they went into. They, they, they brought about a heavenly realm of change and freedom and hope and power and glory and anointing. Their lives were marked by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they knew that the worst thing that could happen to them was the devil, if the Lord allowed it, through somebody might kill them in martyrdom, but they also knew that to, to live as Christ but to die is even better. <laughs> they, they understood very clearly to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So listen, and I know we know that intellectually, we, many of us know that theologically, we believe that, we stand on that, but still we don't live in that reality. You see, let me just say this. And I believe we're seeing a course correction right now in the American church, and we need it. I travel all over, as Jerry said, throughout the nations, but also many places throughout America. The last several years, and I'll say probably the last 24 years, much of the church has been very, very dedicated to becoming relevant to a falling world. Now listen, there's a part of relevance that's fine. I think we should be the most hospitable, the most loving, the most welcoming people on the earth. I'm not against, I don't think all technology is demonic or evil. I think some of it can be, and it sucks a lot of people in. But I'm not against using technology to reach, especially um, Gen Z and Gen X and all that kind of stuff. But let me tell you something, and this is what I'm finding out. Um, and I shared some of this yesterday in my cultural Marxism seminar. I'm finding that even young people want something real in this generation. They want more than a, a pizza party and more than just a social event. They want the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, let me give you an example. Anybody here ever studied martial arts? Anybody? Bobby, anybody else? Anybody ever become a black belt? Are you sure? Some of you look like black belts this morning. <laughs> well, let me just, let me tell you something about martial arts. And I, I studied Taekwondo when I was in middle school in my first couple of years in, um, in high school. One thing that, that kind of fascinated me with Taekwondo um, was the fact that it had its own culture. In other words, when I began to study Taekwondo and I began to do what they were telling me to do. The instructor, he was actually in the Olympics at one time with Taekwondo, very talented, very strong, very powerful man in martial arts. When he began to kind of share with me about Taekwondo, he began to share with me about this ancient culture, this ancient Asian culture. And I'll be honest with you, I was kind of intrigued by it, so much so that for like three years, I did everything that I could do to become like this great Taekwondo guy. And then, then I started gaining a little weight and that all changed. <laughs> Jerry remembers when I was that small. <laughs> but, 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 but anyhow, my point is this. When I walked into that classroom, that first Taekwondo class, I didn't come in here and I say, listen, now you conform to what I'm comfortable with and to what I'm used to so that I can feel more comfortable here. Now listen, I, I'm not talking about being obnoxious and being demonstrative in the sense that we become weird and flaky and freak people. I'm not talking about that. But can I tell you something, friend? The church has become so good at changing the culture of heaven to accommodate the culture of this earth that we have sometimes, I believe, conferred a false salvation on people that have never been converted to Christ. 
and they've never experienced the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And eternity is very foreign to them. And I believe we are in the midst of a course correction. I believe that as darkness gets darker and it's happening, I believe that as we continue to, to battle the forces of hell that are destroying our children and our families and our school systems and everything else, that there is a people who will refuse to back down They will not be moved by the bullies of hell and they will stand in the face of evil and proclaim with love but authority that Jesus is still the only way to salvation. That there is still only one pattern of marriage in the word of God. That a boy is born a boy and he'll always be a boy no matter what he says or does. And I know this is not popular, but friend, this is the result of us allowing that spirit of cultural Marxism and postmodernism to, to, to cause us to fear. Again, we are loving, we are compassionate, we reach out, but we resist the agenda of hell to destroy a generation. And we embrace an eternal mindset. And this is radical, but we would rather lose our heads than compromise the gospel of Jesus. That's the gospel. Paul said in Philippians, by life or by death. God has, listen, I tell you, last year, we saw more salvations in our ministry. I'll never forget, I was in Italy, Sicily, a place called Jela, Sicily, not too far from Catania, Italy, um, Last July, Ken Pounders was with me. Many of you know Ken, another missionary, Eric Miller. And I, I, was, and I was preaching the gospel. I mean, I wasn't holding back. I knew that I was preaching most nights to, I don't want to embellish it, but at least three to 500 young people a night from the age of probably 15 to 35. And I knew that, that, that many of them were in sin, fornication, um, a lot of homosexuality, I mean, polyamory over there, you know, people, multiple people married to each other, just all kind of crazy stuff, stuff that we're seeing in America now. And I came in there with love, but I preached the truth. You can ask Ken Pounders. I've never seen so many radical salvations in in, in the last 20 years of ministry. Not just there, but in other parts of the world and even America, we have seen people that are responding to the truth of the gospel. Listen, you might not know my pastor. His name is Tyson Coughlin. He's a guy that's from this area. (laughs) But anyway, let me tell you something. When I go to, and I'm not there a lot, but when I'm there, I'm, I'm preaching there for him in a little while here, in a few months. But anyhow, but when I'm there, can I tell you something? I'm always, and Jerry, you're amazed at how many young people are there. Because Tyson is not up there telling people that everything, Tyson's preaching the gospel. And there's a hunger among this generation to know something real and to live something real. And we cannot cower down to the spirit of the age. We must be a people that are tethered to eternity. And let all the, let all the nefarious ideological academias who are trying to control our generation and destroy our world, friend. Let them continue to do what we do, but may we refuse to compromise truth and the gospel as we stand in this generation. You see, when we are a people that are owned by eternity, everything in our lives shifts. Leonard Ravenhill said, men that, are, that are, men that are intimate with God are not intimidated by men. Many people live in intimidation. Listen, I, I want to live what James understood, James 4, 14, for your life. What is your life, he said. It's a, it's a vapor, a mist, one translation. He said it just appears for a little time or a little season, and then it just vanishes away. We got one shot. There's no rewind button. Remember, we used to have the old cassettes. We could rewind them. Friend, there's no rewind. In other words, I'll be 56 years old in a few months. I, um, I can't rewind back into my 20s and 30s and 40s. I got the time that I've got. And I want to invest my life into things that have eternal value. I want to live my life 
in such a way that, that when I stand before the judgment seat, I'm not talking about going to hell, but I'm talking about all of us that are Christians, according to Paul, will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our works and our deeds and rewards will be granted accordingly. I don't want to stand before Jesus and say, thank you for saving me, but Lord, I'm, I'm ashamed because I allowed bitterness or I allowed whatever to hinder 10 years of my life. And I tell you something, you can't make up your prayer life at the judgment seat. You can't forgive that person at the judgment seat. It's got to happen now. Eternity has to become real. Now, let me just give you, I've got like... 33 points real quick, and then I'm going to close. <laughs> I'm kidding you. <laughs> Let me just share just a, literally quickly three points, and I'm going to finish. What are some dynamics of being tethered to eternity? Number one, if you're a note taker, we must deliberately live for eternity. Listen to Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold or grab a hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you can make or which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, listen, eternal life, salvation is not static. It's moving. Paul said, grab it. Take a hold of what's real, what matters in your life, and friend, allow it to control everything about you. Can I tell you something? You're going to go home today, and some of you might be a little stirred from this. Some of you are like, man, I'm glad that guy finished finally. And, but some of you will wake up tomorrow, and hopefully you'll continue to be disturbed. But many people historically will get into Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and this will just be a fading memory. And, my, 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 and I'm speaking about me too. That happens to me. But listen, my, my prayer is that this is a landmark, a marker moment in our lives. That we don't leave this place and just live the way that we've always lived, but that we put action as our brother said, that we are doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Listen, our generation, the generations on the earth need people with an eternal mindset more than ever before. You know why you're here this morning? Most everybody, maybe everybody, can share your testimony and somehow relate it back to either a grandmother, some prayer warrior, somebody that loved you enough to share the truth with you. Somebody that maybe took you into their home when you were on skid row. Whatever, friend. Why? Because somebody was faithful to eternity. Therefore, there are many testimonies in this room this morning. I know that I don't stand on my own merit and in my own strength. I stand on the shoulders of men and women of God that lived with the breath of eternity in their spirit. I'm wearing my father-in-law's tie pin or tie tag that Jerry gave me this morning. And I know in my own life, I mean, when they met me, I was fresh, fresh out of Florida, fresh out of dry. I'd only been saved like six and a half, seven months. I mean, <laughs> six, seven and a half months, I was in promiscuous sex, drugs, LSD, cocaine, pot, drinking, partying, going to my dad's in Mobile, doing drugs with my dad. I mean, that, that was six, seven months later, I show up in West Virginia, and Jerry and his parents and a group of people in a little schoolroom out in Turkey Run Road, a little old schoolhouse, begin to pour into my life. I say that to say I know that I don't stand in my own strength, or because I am I'm like Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God, that is it, but I'm also who I am because others paid the price for eternity to become real in my life. You understand? You see, we are responsible, Keith Green said, for the generation that's on the earth. And if we don't live with eternity in view, then we squander our opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. We must be deliberate about eternity. Number two, and I'm going to go quick. We must live and walk in the Spirit and in turn acquire proper vision. Friend, we need a vision of heavenly things. Listen, if our life is consumed with the things of this earth, then we cease to have a hunger for the things that are holy. Let me ask you a question. What is it? What is it that captures your passions this morning? What is it that, that, that captures your heartbeat? Listen, the late 
missionary, Nate Saint, who was martyred with Jim Elliott in the 1950s in Ecuador by the Alca Indians. He said, and the people who don't know the Lord ask, why is it that we are willing to waste our lives as missionaries? They forget that they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble bursts, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for the years they have wasted. In other words, friend, there is nothing wasted. There is nothing wasted when it comes to living for the Lord. My last point is this, and maybe the musicians can come back or at least the keyboardist. So number one, we must deliberately live for eternity. Number two, we must live and walk in the spirit. Paul's very clear, even in 2 um, Corinthians, that we make it our aim to please the Lord, to see him as he is. And number three, we must become misfits. And what does that mean? We must become misfits in a world of misfortune, misery, and misunderstanding. Let me read a very challenging passage of scripture to you. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It doesn't mean, again, that we're just obnoxious and belligerent and we beat people in the head with our black 1611 King James Bibles. And I've seen that craziness. No, we're, we're, but, but here's what it means. We refuse to live after the spirit of this age. Well, brother, everybody's accepted. I mean, mainline denominations have accepted this now. Why are you still? We refuse to conform to things that are anti-biblical and anti-Christ. We, 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 we refuse to, to live in a way that would dishonor our own salvation. Yes. To live in a way that would dishonor those that have ran the race before us. That, as Paul said, entrust this to faithful men. That we refuse to dishonor those faithful men and women that live with eternity in view. That paid the price through tears and, and prayers and some even with their own blood, that we might be honored to be in a place like this this morning to hear the truth of the gospel. What if, what if the government takes your tax status? Take it. What if the government puts a chain on the building? We'll break the chain, and if they take the building down, then we'll just meet in the parking lot if we have to. And that, it's happened throughout history. I don't know what's going to happen in America. Believe you me. If you'd have went back to Venezuela 25 years ago, they would have never, Venezuela was the most successful nation in South America. Wealthy people. They had no idea that Hugo Chavez and then Maduro would come in there and destroy the entire culture and economy and make things illegal that have been free to do for many, many years through socialism and Marxism and everything else. We don't know what's going to happen in America. I, I don't know, but I'm telling you something. You better know Jesus, friend. Eternity better be real because when the creature comforts are taken away, if they are, when it becomes against the law as it is in parts of the world like Canada to preach certain things are sin because the Bible says they are and it becomes a form of hate speech, what are we going to do? You see, if we're not going to live right now, then I doubt we're going to live right when it really gets bad. Amen. Yes, I want to close with a quote and just share one quick story. You can stand. I want to read the words of Justin Martyr, who was a man that lived during the Roman Empire era when Christians were being killed, some in the Colosseums in Rome and different parts of the empire. Justin Martyr said this, it is evident that no one can terrify or subdue us who have believed in Jesus over all the world. For though we are beheaded and crucified and exposed to beasts and chains and fire and all other forms of torture, it is plain that we do not forsake the confession of our faith. But the more things of this kind which happen to us, the more are there others who become believers and truly religious through the name of Jesus Christ. I, I've shared this story here before, but I know there's a lot of new faces here. I, I wanna share this because this, this hits home and this is something that I experienced years ago now. It's been probably seven, eight years ago. It's, time goes so fast. Um, I, was, I was in the nation of Bulgaria preaching 
And I was there several days. I was with actually a pastor from the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia and another group of leaders from that area. He and I had been sharing the preaching responsibilities and we were ministering to leaders during the day and then we were preaching like crusade evangelistic stuff at night. And after the, the final night of meetings that I, pr I preached that night, prayed for literally laid hands on at least 350 people, maybe more, I don't know, a lot of people. But my, my point was I, I was tired. Um, the next day I was flying back out to um, America, back to Pensacola or back to, um, to Charlotte. But, but anyhow, um, that night after the service ended and we were literally about to leave the building, a brother came up to me and he said, brother, would you come and preach in my church? I said, yeah, I'd be honored to, man. Just, you know, give me your information. And, you know, when I'm back over here, what? he said, no, no, would you come and preach in my church tonight? I'm like, man, I, you know, I fly out in like seven hours and I'm exhausted. That's what I'm thinking. And honestly, when I looked at his face, it was like a desperation for me to come there. And my, my buddy, Jerry's met Wayne Stotler. My buddy Wayne was beside me and Wayne's up in his 80s now and he was in his 70s in, upper 70s. But I looked at Wayne, he said, let's go, brother. I said, let's go, brother. So long story short, we, we went there. And we got in his car, we began to drive. And I, I'm thinking honestly in my mind that maybe his church is down the road or the next town over in Bulgaria. But after being in the car for probably 45 minutes or so, he said, now we are entering my nation of Turkey. So we had crossed over the Bulgarian border up in the mountains and we were in the nation of Turkey up in the mountains. When we got into Turkey, we drove another probably 15, 20 minutes. By this time, it's literally like two o'clock in the morning. He stops the car and he said, we have to walk from here. So I didn't realize it then, but the reason we had to walk is because they didn't wanna expose us to anything that was dangerous in the little village or the little town that they lived in. So we. We stopped the car and he just said to follow him. So Wayne and I began to walk behind him, literally in the woods. And after several minutes of walking, we arrived at his little church building. He said, this is, this is my building. He said, come in. His building, and you've heard this some of you, but it was literally the, the back, like a cargo um, shipment container or like the back of an 18-wheeler truck. That was his building. And they had cut little holes in the, for windows and had a door with a curtain. And I remember it was freezing, probably Fahrenheit, at least in the mid-20s. It was really cold. I was blowing smoke as I was talking and preaching. All they had in the building was three little, like old hurricane lanterns, we called them, little kerosene lanterns just kind of dispersed throughout the building. And as I walked in, the people were so packed in there that I remember I had to, Wayne and I had to walk sideways like this to get to the middle of the little, little facility there. As I got there, he said, brother, just begin to preach. And to be honest with you, I was tired, I didn't really know what to preach. I just began to kind of exhort them of how much the Lord loved them. And you know, I was beginning to kind of understand that, that these people were very sold out to the Lord. N number one, they're at a church service at 2 a.m. in the morning because they heard I was coming to preach. And here they are, I mean, just eyes wide open. I'm about five, maybe 10 minutes into my message and I begin to hear loud thuds against the outside of this metal container building. And I didn't know what was going on. I looked at the pastor, and I said, what's happening? He said, they know we're here. He said, just keep preaching. A young group of Muslim men, radicalized Muslim men had gathered on the outside of the building. And they were throwing rocks at the building, trying to intimidate us from being there and trying to scare us off. Somehow they had found out that we were there. I didn't realize it at the time, but this pastor on two different occasions, his children who were young, like five and maybe 11 or something like that, by order of a Muslim cleric had had their shirts taken off and tied to a post and cane bloody in the middle of the village because their dad preached the gospel. I also found out that they had literally set a bomb off in the front of, that, of the pastor's house several months back and destroyed most of the front of the house. I didn't know any of this when he asked me to come preach. He didn't tell me any of these details. I, I, I'm there and to be honest with you, a part of me wishes I could tell you that, man, I was just like Superman, Holy Ghost, missionary Keith Collins from Wakulla County, Florida. But I'll be honest with you, there was an immediate fear that I experienced in my humanity. And um, man, and the pastor said, just keep preaching. So I, I kept preaching, but then something supernatural happened and this forever messed with me in a good way. As I looked at these people, to be honest with you, most of them were probably middle-aged to older women with like scars all around their head. All you could see is their faces. 
But it was almost as if like their faces became like the face of Moses when he came out of the presence with the Lord. I mean, there was like an illumination and just a little flickering kerosene. There wasn't a lot of light. But literally, I began to see eternity on their faces and in their eyes. And it, 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 it so disturbed me in a holy way that the next thing that happened to me, I, I've never had happened since or before. I literally felt like warm oil was pouring down all over my body. And I'll tell you this much, I've never preached that good before or after. <laughs> As I pre it, I, I, This is weird. I, I literally felt like I was not even preaching. And, and I was like preaching revelatory. In other words, saying things that very deliberately connected to where they were and their lifestyle. And the Lord just completely possessed my vocal box and my mouth as the Holy Spirit came over me. That lasted for probably 40 minutes or so, and then we, we prayed for people. And the brother told us this. We knew we had to get back. At this time, it's 4.30 in the morning or so probably. We had to get back to get ready to catch a plane. The brother told, my, told Wayne and me this. He said, brothers, he said, put your hands over your face like this and put your head down and just follow me. Because in his mind, they were probably going to at least pelt us with rocks or stone us. Now, for some reason, I don't know why. I guess because I'm supposed to be here this morning, <laughs> among other things. It's appointed a man wants to die. It was not my appointed time to die or even to suffer in my body for the gospel. But I, 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 I was very close, very close to what I think saints throughout the ages have felt as they were willing to give their lives for the glory of Jesus. And I want to tell you something. There is a grace in persecution. There is a grace in standing for truth. There is a supply of eternal heavenly glory that's applied to those that are willing to live for Jesus no matter what it costs us. He becomes everything. I want you to bow your heads before him this morning. Here's my heart for you. Will you behold Jesus this morning, my friend? Will you see him in his beauty and his holiness? Will you behold his mangled, bloody body on a cross, willingly laying himself down to not just set you free, but that through you others could be set free? Will you behold the task at hand? What is the task? To make disciples of the nations. Oh, and that's not just for the missionaries and the priests. That's for every one of us. Will you allow eternity to consume your passions today. Friend, this world is quickly moving away from us. I mean, everything is going very, very fast. All my grandparents are gone. My parents are near 80. They just spent a, a, a week with me. They're getting feeble. Everything that's ever been common and normal is just going quickly. What are you going to do, friend? All that matters is eternity this morning. What are you living for? What are you allowing to hinder you this morning? If you're here this morning and you would simply say, Jesus, I want to live for eternity. I want my life to count for eternity. When I stand before Jesus, I want to be able to say, Lord, I was faithful to preach your gospel. I was faithful to love my neighbor. I was faithful to pray for my kids, no matter how rotten they are. I was faithful, Lord, to love the unlovable. I was faithful to reach out to the ones that everybody else says, quit wasting your time on them. Friend, when eternity becomes real, these things come into view. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And eternity is just a sermon from a preacher from North Carolina. But you don't really know Jesus, friend. Eternity can become real to you this morning. He's not asking for you to be holy as you come. He's asking for you to come to him because he is holy. He does the work. He sets you free. If you need to give your heart to Jesus, I'm going to ask, I know Pastor Jerry's here, if there's other elders or other pastoral people here, if we could just maybe come and stand across the front people that Pastor Jerry knows. If you're here this morning, two things. Number one, you want to give your heart to Jesus. Or number two, you want to come and you want to say, Lord, I, I want to live for eternity. I, I want to let maybe some of the things that have hindered me fall off of me. And I want to be freshly impacted 
by who you are Some in my of you life elders come so that forward. I can be used for your glory. This altar is open this morning. I'm going to come down and pray as well. Would you come if the Lord Jesus. is tugging on your heart this morning? Would you come in Jesus' name?